My name's Julian McDonald. Um, for those who haven't met me before, um, I'm president of the Australian BPD Foundation, and we've been running these um, sessions in collaboration with the Mental Health Professional Network for a few years now. Um, so we tonight, I think we're in for a bit of a treat, really, of a very different sort, um, and you'll find out what I mean as we go along. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce Flip Gray, um, who I met several years ago um, when she assisted us to organise the first um, national BPD conference. And Flick and Marinda Epstein made a fantastic contribution to that um, conference. They challenged us uphill and down dale. <laughs> which was very exciting actually, it was very interesting and I think we all learned a heap from that experience as I'm sure you will tonight. Um, <clears throat> I wondered what to say to you about Flick and I consult with Flick about this because she's really spanned an awful lot of areas um, in relation to BPD and many other things as well. And we decided that perhaps she's best described as a flexible juggler and explorer, and I'll add on with an inquiring and a very challenging mind, and I'm sure you, you may well come to that conclusion um, after hearing her speak. Since being offered, as was put in the little bio, I'm not sure whether that was your phrasing or Rita's your mine. phrasing, I thought it may well have been, so I didn't change it. Um, so since being offered a BPD diagnosis back in 2005, Flick has been exploring and involving herself in the BPD world in many and varied ways. And I'll just mention a few um, and you'll hear more about the various um, things Flick has been involved with as, she, um, as her talk unfolds in 2011. <coughs> Um, she was a speaker at the International Society uh, for Study of BPD Congress um, and she's also been the inaugural care, so she's done a few inaug inaugural things, that's a terrible word to pronounce. Um, she was the inaugural um, care, uh, consumer consultant at Spectrum in 2015 to 16. Um, she um, was awarded the same Australia Fellowship to explore the intersection between <coughs> peer work and open dialogue. I think you studied open dialogue in Finland, is that right? Okay. You can. I'll get to that. Right, okay. Um, so as you can see, many and varied. And um, currently, amongst many other um, involvements, um, Flick um, is the lead international intentional, intentional lead intentional peer support um, trainer yeah, um, for the post for the expanded post discharge support <coughs> scheme. I'll get to that. So too. good. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to. Um, hearing all about this, as I'm sure you are. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out how to arrange <coughs> myself so that I can see you all, or maybe you can hide behind the computer if you want, that's fine. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting being back at Spectrum. <laughs> you know, it's being, here we are at Spectrum and also I'm involved with the BPD Foundation because part of my work has actually been challenging this conceptualisation, this, this thing of BPD. Um, but I really do try to do that in a way that stays connected, that's kind of like how do we have these conversations um, because I think there's some really challenging conversations to be had. So it's kind of lovely to be invited back and be like, yay, I haven't been so challenging and kind of... Um, yeah, that, that the conversation's not, you know, kind of still juicy and alive, so yeah. Um, I have kind of been exploring the world the last couple of years. I am, I have so many frequent flyer points, it's ridiculous, and I'm so... Like when someone says, do you want to come and do this thing interstate or overseas? I'm like, oh God, which I know is a really quality problem to have, but I'm, um, yeah. 
and actually Maria's come from Ireland and was saying, gosh, it's a long way for you to get here. And I was like, yeah, really, Australia's a long way from Europe, which is where I've, Europe and America is where I've been, but I'll get to that. So that's why it says exploring the world for other possibilities. And I say, I mean both the external world and also my own internal world. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, I do, I mean, you could call it autoethnographic. I do use my own experiences a lot. And not just my own personal experiences, I'm very connected with networks of people who are trying to think about these, um, these experiences, but from the perspective of people who have this level. Yeah. So, where I've come from, um, I'm going to try and position myself so I can say, I start off with childhood trauma um, is really important in my story, but particularly it's both abuse and also misattunement is one way of describing it. I think when we talk about trauma, it can be really easy to think that there has to be a bad guy involved, that there has to be like a bad thing that happened. Thank you. Rita and I used to work together and it's kind of lovely to be like, oh. <laughs> um, so misattunement is a way of thinking about the relationship between a child and a caregiver. I'm sure lots of you know this, but that can be incredibly traumatic if there's a mismatch, if a child doesn't actually have a caregiver that, they can, that, that there's an attunement relationship with. And so in my childhood, I had one parent who was abusing me and one parent that we just had a really difficult attunement relationship with, which that's traumatic for a child to not have a safe adult attachment figure. Um, I was diagnosed informally with BPD in 2005. It was definitely offered to me. I know that's not everyone's experience of receiving this diagnosis, but the CAT team was called by my partner because I was suicidal, self-harming and had explosive anger and my partner was like, I don't know what to do, maybe we should get some mental health help and we called the CAT team and they said, sometimes when people have these experiences, they have this diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, maybe you should read up about it. And I did, I read a lot, I'm a very big nerd. At the time I was an academic at uni, at Melbourne Uni, I was working as a researcher, as a lecturer, tutor. Um, in linguistics, but also in, I was moving into sociology and politics. And what I read didn't really make sense to me. As a critical thinker, it actually felt like people were saying, you have BPD because you have these symptoms, and you have these symptoms because you have BPD, and you have these, and it just felt like this, but like, but why? Like, well, how does it make sense? And it just felt really confusing to me. And I, so I just kept reading and reading and reading anything I could that would make sense of my experiences. And then I stumbled across the work of Marinda Epstein, who Julian mentioned, who's, she identifies herself as a high profile nutcase. Um, she's definitely one of the leaders of the consumer survivor movement in Australia. She's won a human rights award for her work. She did a lot of work with Spectrum over the years. Um, she's been on a lot of national committees. She's just been very, very um, active in making sense of, um, of how mental health services <coughs> might respond to the experiences that people have. And so through Marinda, I became part of the International Consumer Survivor Expatient Movement, which is sometimes what it's called. Um, and I ch basically Marinda would say, here's this person, you should meet them. And I got to meet a lot of really amazing people. Um, I worked at an organisation called Our Consumer Place, and I got to, from that role, I got to call people and interview them and say, hi, my name's Flick, can I interview you? Um, and so just got to meet a lot of you know, people around the world that were trying to make sense of experiences from the inside. So a bit like anthropology kind of has tended to look at cultures and from the outside and kind of, I mean, anthropology's changed a lot, but historically, you know, it's kind of been a, oh, look at these people. And then indigenous people or, you know, there are people from various cultures have spoken back and have said, actually, this is how we make sense. And so for me, the consumer survivor expatient movement has really been grounded in how do we make sense of our experiences from a sense of a we. Um, and then I was engaged with BPD for many, many years. So yeah, as Julian said, I spoke, I went to the International Congress, the ISSPD, when it was in Melbourne and spoke at that, helped organise the inaugural BPD Awareness Day in 2011, um, contributed chapters to mental health to one mental health textbook about BPD and came and worked at Spectrum um, as a consumer consultant here for a while. So that's kind of my grounding in like I really did kind of nerdily engage with this stuff with BPD and also try and engage with people who are kind of doing this work and see like how do we make sense of this stuff. What am I 
up to now, um, Julian asked me, what are you doing these days? And I thought, I don't have a one-word answer. You know, when you get a form, like at the airport, and they say, what's your occupation? I just put consultant, because I'm like, it's, I don't know. Consultant at least says, pay me money, whereas consumer consultant says, don't worry about the money, I'm here for the love of it. Um, so I've ended up, um, oh, the other thing that the consumer survivor movement led me to is the alternatives movement. So a lot of people around the world thinking about how we might think differently about responding to mental distress, aside from sort of hospitals, diagnoses, medications, treatments, that kind of, um, and I'm, I'm aware that within sort of those systems, there's lots and lots of alternatives too, but there are people who actually argue that we need to completely, like think outside of the sort of dominant paradigm, particularly the biomedical model um, of thinking about uh, distress. And I ended up um, engaged with um, a approach called Open Dialogue. And what drew me to Open Dialogue is that it's, it's both quite radical in terms of the way in which it thinks about distressing experiences. It actually sees experiences not in an individual, but as relational. And so in terms of in practice, what it looks like is that you, um, if someone calls up a service and says, you know, I'm in distress, doesn't matter if it's a person with a diagnosis or a family member or a neighbour or a school teacher, you know, whoever's concerned and there are worries. This is in, in, in theory anyway, and this comes from Finland. Um, what you do is you say, who should we bring together? And you bring together a network of people to talk. And the idea is, so originally it started off that the talking was actually just putting all the treatment options on the table and kind of thinking, well, there's this option, there's this option. And, and actually they discovered over time that actually just the talking, the whole network coming together and actually being able to talk about difficult things. Um, often there's unspoken things or things that are just butting up against each other and that there's just no space to really um, listen to each other and be heard and held in that process. And so the thing that appeals to me about open dialogue is it both makes sense to me intellectually, and so in some ways it's kind of quite challenging to the dominant system, but actually it's also been taken up. It is the system in some parts of the world. So in, in Torino, in Finland, where it's kind of, that's the, the, the place where everyone goes if they want to go and see open dialogue in its purest form, which I challenge that idea anyway. But um, that's where it's, that's sort of one of the homes of open dialogue, but there are many, many, many places in the world where they're really, uh, the mainstream mental health system is taking up this approach. Um, and it's not just family inclusive, it's actually seeing that, the, that you are responding to the whole network. And it's not to pathologise the whole network either, it's not saying, oh, they're all sick, but it is to say that everyone has a, has a, has a place. And what it also means is that sometimes there'll be a grandfather who's involved, and he's not kind of someone that the mental health system would traditionally sort of see as a source of wisdom and someone who might have a perspective. But actually sometimes when someone's a little bit outside of the most heated kind of part of it, they actually have a crucial perspective. And I've seen many, many network meetings, and I facilitate network meetings these days, where there might be mum's best friend who's known the kid for the, his whole life and, you know, just seeing everyone as, as, as worthy of being listened to and of having something really important to bring it also involves anyone, any clinicians or any sort of anyone in the network, if there's a school teacher who might be, who might be useful to have in the room. Um, certainly I do some work with people who are in long term, like CQs, uh, you know, people who are in extended kind of um, envi extended care environments and sometimes there's a bit of a stuckness, people don't really know where to go and so the idea is you bring more voices and more voices and hopefully together we can find some movement. Um, and so I studied in the UK for three years, and that's partly why I'm utterly exhausted with travelling, because I flew backwards and forwards for quite a lot of that. Um, I also got some money from SANE Australia to travel around Europe and around the US looking at open dialogue, and in particular I'm interested <coughs> in how peer workers are, uh, are working in, in open dialogue. And I was accepted into my course in London as someone with a lived experience background. There were three of us who didn't have a social worker, psychiatrist, <coughs> psychologist, any of those hats. We came as people with lived experience. So I was interested in how that's what's, what that's looking like around the world. So one of my other jobs, as Julian tried to get her head around, but it's lots of words, lead intentional peer support facilitator, expanding post-discharge support initiative, Department of Health and Human Services. Well, Basically what I'm saying is that... <coughs> The Department of Health and Human Services trust me enough to employ me to train, to lead the training around. Um, there's a whole bunch of new peer workers who have been employed when people are 
um, being discharged from hospital because it's a really high risk period for people. Um, I'm, I have some hesitations about the program because basically what could go wrong with employing a whole bunch of new inexperienced peer workers and distributing them across the whole mental health system and allowing each service to completely reinvent the system and kind of have a, have a go at it when people are at their most vulnerable. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? Um, it's been a really complex project, but um, I was brought in because there was, a, there was a pilot stage of it and they actually realised that people didn't really know what peer work was. It's not kind of something you can just make up. It has a rich tradition and a kind of there, there's actually a sophistication to it. And intentional peer support was picked as the, the framework for thinking about um, what peer work is. I'm also peer support manager one day a week, but Partner Speaks a tiny organisation, but I'm so excited about it. Um, we support the partners and families of people who look at online child abuse materials. So if someone, also called child pornography, but child abuse materials is how we language it. If someone discovers that their partner or their son or their brother is looking at these materials, there's often absolutely no support and actually it's an utterly devastating experience and is really, really complex. A lot of um, wives in particular end up homeless. Um, there's a whole lot of sort of complexities end up single parents, concerns about safety of every child that's ever been you know, near the home. So, and we are very, very fiercely peer support um, and I'm absolutely passionate about what peer support we can offer. And in particular, it's that magic that can happen when someone's been through something similar that is a really specific experience that's kind of hard to understand unless you've been through it. And that there are just some ways of saying, oh, so you've been through this too. There is a kind of magic that can happen, particularly when it's a complex experience that is hard to... Like, so, for example, being a, you know, a family member of someone who's been looking at online child abuse materials, there is a magic that can happen when you meet someone else who's been through that. So. Also project worker at Shark, so an alcohol and other drug service. Similarly, they're, they're taken up intentional peer support as their model of practice, and so it's my job to kind of support that implementation. Advocate for alternative ways of understanding madness and distress, this kind of stuff. I do a lot of talking. Someone said, you know, have you done many talks? Or I, I do a lot of public speaking. It's kind of something I really, really enjoy. So. <coughs> and a mad studies academic. I do a bit of um, academic work as well. And mad studies is the discipline that I language that I'm part of. It's an emerging discipline. It didn't exist when I started my PhD. It now exists. Um, it is quite an extraordinary, rich, fertile discipline. Um, and for me, it's really about centering the experiences of distress and madness and all the things that it could be but from the lived experience but it's also not exclusive to <coughs> you have to have a certain a certain identity or experience to be able to belong it's not that but it welcomes philosophers sociologists you know historians looking at different cultural understandings it really kind of expands how we think about these experiences so that's what i'm up to um, I thought I'd put in some recent career highlights in case you're like, I don't know, kind of doubting that anyone takes me seriously. It's really weird. I started being invited into like a lot of quite mainstream environments. So I was keynote speaker at the Danish Open Dialogue Network annual general meeting this, I mean annual meeting this year alongside Harleen Anderson. And I don't know if any of you are family therapists, but she's kind of a, a family therapist guru. We read her a lot in my course and then I was up there like, she and I were the keynote speakers and I was like, this is weird. Um, but I, and also put together a resource with Kath Roper, who some of you may have heard of. She's a consumer academic, and Emma Cadogan, who works in the department around co-production. So I'm really interested in how we bring together the different perspectives, um, particularly how we attend to power. So there's co-production is a bit of a buzzword in mental health at the moment. It's like let's just all come together. There could like, what could possibly go wrong when someone who's been in services and someone who's provided services just hang out together? You know. There's a very big power difference and also just all sorts of complexities. So yeah, we did some work around that. I was invited to speak in the US and New Zealand last year. That was really cool. Um, probably the most exciting is publishing um, in Asylum magazine, the magazine for democratic psychiatry in the UK. It's a magazine that I've read for years and just found really exciting. And so to be published in that was like, oh my gosh. And I wrote about um, my experience of being what I call just borderline mad. And it's because in the open dialogue world, psychosis is really centered as the kind of the experience that we respond to. And there's this, this talk about we respond to anything and anyone. And I'm like, what if, like, 
my experience of trying to seek help for my experiences was very much kind of you're not serious enough for us to respond and I'm like hang on how does this keep happening how do we keep telling people their distress doesn't matter particularly in an environment like open dialogue that says no no come come we welcome everyone so yeah I was kind of having a look at that experience of yeah keynote speaker at the mental health services conference last year that was really awesome um, that's online, actually, and if you want to, you know, hear anything more that I have to say, if it all interests you, that that's around. And then I was also interviewed on ABC Radio. That is the coolest experience to be like, that's me on the radio. <laughs> um, and one of them does. I do talk a bit about um, my thinking about BP Day. So if there's any kind of threads of this that you want to kind of go back to, I've got all these resources at the end too. And then yeah, the same Australia Hocking Fellowship, which. That was a really interesting experience because I'm quite critical of Satan and at one point they were not quite sure they'd give me the award because they said like you're kind of biting the hand that feeds you, you know that right? And I was like, I'll be good. No, I didn't say I'll be good. I said, look, that is what I believe and you know, I'm really happy to keep having these conversations and we were really able to, I think Satan's been extraordinarily supportive of my work, which is interesting because I think Satan does have quite a different paradigm to what I speak of, but I think that we can keep I think there's a lot of conversations that are needed and we just need to stay, I really do believe in dialogue and if we can bring these things together and talk and be like, how, what do you believe? Where are the sticking points? How do we, how do we talk about this? Um, yeah. How do I really identify? That was my like credibility, like I'm a big kid too. Um, Wandering Mad Academic is actually my favourite, um, one of my favourites. The wandering part is that I'm not actually trying to find a place that I can be like, this is the answer, this is the, the end of the story. I'm like, no, I kind of wander around and see like what's happening. Um, and my mind is very sort of associative and I, I, I don't feel like this is the last word. I don't feel like I'll be like, I will spend the rest of my life re you know, reinforcing my beliefs that I've already got. It's like, no, I keep wandering and seeing what's happening. And, um, and mad studies is really my discipline. Part unicorn, I do, that is, there is a whole story around that, but I am quite serious that the unicorn is a way of understanding how I am in the world. And part of that is that I've got quite a lot of energy and I'll butt up, up, up against people and I'll forget that my horn's actually quite pointy and could sort of hurt people, so I have to learn as a unicorn to like, come on, be gentle, you know, so. Person with child parts, I'm going to go more into that. That's actually the most, it's one of the frameworks that I find most useful for understanding my experiences. Um, so understanding my experience in terms of its history in childhood trauma and also the way in which I can now behave in ways that are actually child parts of me that are sort of taking over. So for example my anger I understand as a child part. There's all sorts of parts so I'm going to go into that. And also that helps me understand what things that I need to do to support myself you know, and to grow and heal but actually really attending to those child parts is actually crucial in my life. So, for example, on a day-to-day -day level, I have little parts who choose what socks I wear, which sounds ridiculous, but it's like, if I'm going to go to work, and, and I want to be able to like, not have this part of me that's like, I don't want to go to work, no. Um, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which I can attend to those needs that were not met as a child and keep going in the world. So how to kind of balance that. Um, and you know, I have a lot of soft toys and all sorts of things that actually are really specific to me and what I argue is that those child parts are really quite wise, that actually we need to learn to listen to those child parts um, and that that gives us a whole bunch of resources for working with people and it also shifts the paradigm because my child parts are mine and I'm the only one who can A, really hear them and B, it's kind of my job to take care of them. I can get support from people but like no one can rescue me, like it's, it, that's my job. So it is actually, that's kind of annoying and frustrating because there is an impulse to be like, somebody help me! Um, so yeah, this, this framing of being a person with child parts I found really um, profound way of understanding my experiences. And this final one as well, a relational barometer, canary in the mind, receptacle for disavowed emotions. I'll come to this, I actually, and this is from my open dialogue training, I really do see that BPD can be understood interpersonally. And so for example, the person I currently see for therapy would never describe me as BPD. I just, I just don't behave in the kinds of ways that I, that I would do in other relationships. There are certainly therapeutic relationships where between us, I become BPD. And it's not that it's just about me or just about them, but there is a dynamic that is interpersonal. And that can also um, function in, in bigger networks. So for example, 
Um, there are all sorts of contexts I mean, I've been in where I'm the one who's like, um, something's really not okay. And you know, you can talk about it as a canary in the mine, it's a kind of sensitivity. And then I argue that it's actually a resource, it's a rich resource. We often demonise people with BPD and see us as a bad thing that should be silenced or shut down in some sort of fundamental way. Or self-harm or suicidality, they're kind of seen as problems to be fixed. And I flip that very much so, and I'm, I'm not saying that these are wonderful things that everyone should feel suicidal, but I mean, they're actually a language and there's a lot of meaning and value in them, and that as a network, if we're able to hear those things, that's actually, I think, a gift, which I'll come back to. Um, just thinking, I might actually pause there and suggest, I don't know where you guys are all at, but I was just thinking maybe like a couple of minutes if you just want to talk with the person or a, people, a few people near you, just like where you're at right now, because I feel like I could talk at you and it could be really exhausting, so maybe <coughs> um, just like, let's say, Four minutes, so just find someone near you and just, you know, where you're at. Maybe say hi, it doesn't even have to be about what I've said. I'm going to just share a little bit, um, a little bit more, because I, I didn't put professional overshare, but that's also one of my <laughs> favourite hats. And I do Mine that. Too. Really? Yeah. yeah. I just, I get enough feedback over the years that when I share what I've experienced, sometimes I put into words things that other people didn't know that anyone else had felt and so I think it can reduce shame is the main thing that I am kind of committed to and also I'm committed to reducing my own shame. I found BPD to actually be full of shame um, both prior to diagnosis but even more so after diagnosis. It really felt like I was being told that it was my fault and my I have a personality disorder like it just does my head in how, how um, Particularly when I understand my experiences as making sense in the context of childhood trauma, it felt a particularly cruel kind of figure to point. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've really tried to work at since then is how do we not point fingers? <laughs> but because there, like, it's really easy to point fingers all over the place and be like, it was my mother's fault, or it was my father's fault, or it was the system's fault. And it's like there's, there's kind of truth in some of that. And you know, some of my behaviour's been really. I've done some really not great things over the years, but um, yeah, how do we find ways of talking about hard stuff that isn't just kind of blaming, particularly a, a person I think who's in enormous distress. Um, so I'm going to just share a tiny um, example of sort of how I've reframed my experiences. So I ended up in hospital, I, I've ended up in hospital many times, but um, the last time I thought I'd talk about Partly because I just, I like to live a bit on the edge and I haven't talked about this in a talk before so I was like, ooh, new, new material. Um, yeah, so I had stopped eating and I was actually getting, I'd lost a lot of weight and that was a new thing for me. I hadn't ever really, food wasn't a thing that I'd ever kind of had struggled with but I was actually struggling to eat at all. And so for about three months, I was, sausage was about the only thing I could, and even then, it was a battle every time. Um, and I was starting to, I mean, I was having tests, you know, physical tests and all this kind of stuff. I was also um, acutely suicidal. I very, very, um, thought spent a lot of time thinking about how I might die, how I could do it, planning, um, you know, really micro details about exactly, you know, what songs would be at my funeral and, you know, just a lot of thought put into that and spent a lot of time and energy. Um, I found it very difficult to do anything other than work. So I would struggle to get up in the morning. Um, it was a really hard effort to get out of bed. I'd get to work, I could work, I could put on my happy face, my professional I'm fine face. And literally as soon as I got back to my car, I would be, like, I couldn't move. It was this kind of, like, I'd just sit in my car and play computer games, and it was kind of this overwhelm. Um, I was struggling to um, figure out what work I was going to be, like, what, where I fit with work. Like, I did have work, but I felt a really strong sense of not belonging or not really sure that I was doing the right thing. Um, anyway, and the, the suicidality was actually getting out of control to a point where I was actually very, very concerned about my safety, as was my therapist at the time. And <coughs> the particular part of it was that even though I, like it wasn't that I was sure I wanted to die, but I was doing impulsive things. And there was a definitely a sense, particularly driving was not safe. So I wasn't kind of 100% committed to staying safe in a kind of way that I should have been on the roads. 
and um, I'm not going to describe exactly how I ended up in hospital, but there were police, there was ambulance, there was a whole lot of ways. You know, I ended up being taken to hospital. And that in itself was kind of interesting because I, I work in this system and so it's like, oh god, what hospital can I go to? Um, who am I going to see? Like, it was just a kind of nightmare. And when I got there, the ED department, I don't know how many people have spent time in ED when you're in distress or someone you love is in distress. It's not exactly the most calming, reassuring environment. It's kind of weird and chaotic and you feel a bit like nobody gives a damn because they've got more important people to attend to. and. You're kind of supposed to just sit there and wait for like five or six hours and it's a really weird experience particularly when you're kind of not sure if you want to be alive and it's kind of this like so this is encouraging <laughs> like i really want to stay here um but eventually i you know they they did um you know take me into the, the bit where there's the curtains and you know someone sits down and they do a bit of an assessment and they they gave me three new diagnoses um, in fact, does anyone want to guess what diagnosis I got? I feel like I've not done this, but I'm... <laughs> Bipolar? This is, pardon? Bipolar too. Bipolar! Thank you. That was, I got bipolar. Anorexia? Yeah. Anorexia, yes. And the other one you're not even going to possibly guess because I can't even remember. It's one of the schizo personality disorders. Schizo I'm not sure if, I don't know which of the personality disorders it was. Schizotypal or schizo, there's two of them and I've read them and I'm like, I can't remember. Because not long after I heard these diagnoses, I was also given a lanzapine. Schizoid. Schizoid or schizotypal, they're the two. But before all of this happened, before I found out the diagnoses, I was also left alone for quite a long time. And I have a tendency to run because I was in a fight or flight stage. And I do have to say, the hospital I was at, it's kind of near the city. And the views from all the different floors were just incredible. And there were like swivel chairs and I was just like going wild. And I got back down and I was like, nobody even noticed that I, that I went away. <laughs> Which is kind of shocking that I went there because I was suicidal and I felt like my life, not, not just I, you know, like police took me there. So the fact that I could run away was kind of a bit shocking to me. And then, just because I'm me, I ran away a second time because I was like, how far can this go? And I went across the road and I was playing in the fountain and... I was having a great old time, but also crossing the road was actually really dangerous. Like, I didn't care. I didn't look both ways and check that it was the middle of the night. You know, it was a really dangerous situation. And when I got back, they did say, oh, you should, probably shouldn't have done that. And it was just this idea that I could take responsibility for my safety in that, in that, point, of, in that point of time was kind of, um, wasn't the most useful response. Like, you shouldn't do that. I'm like, you think I'm able to, like, kind of just calmly sit down and go, you know what, you're right. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm... I'm just going to sit here quietly now. You know, I was in a highly distressed state. And then they gave me a lanzapine. But they didn't tell me what it was. They just said, here, take this. And I also hadn't slept much in the last couple of days. Um, they said, take this. And I said, what is it? Because <laughs> I figured I don't really want to put something into my body without even a little bit of information, let alone informed consent. And they said, it'll help you sleep. And I also had on my records, which they'd read, that I already have an antipsychotic that I took for sleep, but of course that wasn't. Anyway, I took the antipsychotic, woke up in the morning and said, I'm fine, don't worry, and they let me go. So that was my, that was my experience. And I, I have to say, it didn't exactly help. It, it kind of didn't even really keep me safe. But because I have a private therapist, it was kind of, they were really happy to be like, woohoo, we can pass this one on. But in hindsight, I didn't find anorexia, bipolar, or schizo, whatever, diagnoses useful. That was like three more. I already had six. It really didn't kind of... And, you know, in some ways, BPD is the most useful explanatory frame, but also, like, I kind of was. If you look at the checklist for bipolar, sure, I wasn't sleeping, I was fluctuating between, you know, sure. But in hindsight, the way I make sense of it is I had um, not long before reported my father for abusing me. I was going through the police process and it was a really, really painful experience. Um, the police would every now and again just ring me up and say, so was it a right hand or a left hand? You know, that kind of like, what the fuck? It was a really, really, um, I felt out of control. It felt like I was constant, like I was desperately trying to hold someone to account who had done things, but actually I felt like I wasn't, like, I felt like it actually wasn't going to be a useful process. And in the end, it was my word against his and the, the court case didn't go anywhere. And that was also kind of devastating. But also the way in which people around me didn't really know how to respond or support <coughs> me. I was quite, um, 
unsettled by that and also night times were really difficult because stuff had happened to me at night and so I was kind of revisiting my trauma and also the suicidality made sense to me in the sense that I felt quite trapped I actually felt like I didn't know how to get out of some of the commitments I'd made and that it felt like the, the relational difficulties, the like people that would hate me is the story I had in my head. So actually dying was sort of the only way out. Um, but also the not eating was actually precipitated by every time I had a conversation with my mother, I would stop eating and then we wouldn't have some contact and then for a while I'd, I'd be okay. And I actually realised that there was a lot of communication going on in the not eating. It was a way of communicating something but without actually using words. And it was a way of having power and control over my boundaries, and particularly with what happened to me as a kid, it was a way of saying no. I got to a point where I was like, you know what, no. And actually reporting my father was part of that no. So for me, it actually was a really rich experience that, um, you know, being able to unpack it, it actually meant a lot. It wasn't this meaningless thing that you could just diagnose and say, like bipolar, it's just not a useful explanation for what was going on. And I really like um, John Giordini's expression. So John Giordini is a child psychiatrist in, child and adolescent psychiatrist in Adelaide. And he describes diagnoses as sometimes being unexplanatory. They actually get in the way. They kind of say, this is why this thing is happening, instead of actually asking, why is this thing happening? And so, you know, to say that I had, an, I had anorexia, it's like, why do I have anorexia? Can you explain this to me? Why all of a sudden it, like, in my late 30s, I suddenly developed an eating disorder. Like it didn't kind of offer an explanatory frame. Um, whereas understanding, like really listening to these experiences. The other part that I understand is the part that ran away and played in the fountain, I understand as my inner eight year old who, when I was a very small child being abused, I didn't have a caregiver, but there was a point in my childhood where I kind of figured out that adults just didn't get it. That's okay, I'm just gonna like take care of things myself. And that part can be really, really creative and kind of playful and, you know, has all sorts of um, ideas, but is a young child part. And, you know, my job at the moment is to really stay online as a grown up and make sure that that little eight year old has those needs met, but also doesn't get to like drive the car or, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes when I get dressed in the morning, I'm like, come on guys, we don't match. Like these, I cannot please you all. So. Um, you know, there is a kind of adult role, but I really understand, you know, that part of me that wanted to go running, I understand as a particular part of me, it's not just a bipolar symptom, it actually has a lot of meaning for me, specifically and personally. So, um, it's not a lot more content, you'll be grateful, maybe. Um, rethinking BPD, some possibilities. So, some people talk about it as trauma. Sure, that's kind of part of it, but I'm a bit critical of, particularly one of my diagnoses is complex PTSD. I argue that some of the most painful traumas are the ones we don't have words for. So I think PTSD can sometimes be a kind of, do you have a trauma that we can point to and say, ah, oh, that's why you're broken. Um, that's been my experience anyway. And so in my story, you may well say, well, childhood sexual abuse, there you go, you got a trauma, ding, ding. Um, Actually, it was my relationship with my mother that's much more complex. I can point to my father and go to the police, and the police will say, yeah, that was a crime, that was a crime, that was a crime. That's actually much easier for me to, um, in, in an embodied way, make, make sense of and have people respond to. The stuff with other members of my family, the sort of complex ways in which people don't get me and I don't get them, and they thought I was this, and that kind of stuff. And it's not to blame my mother at all. In open dialogue training, we do a lot of family of origin work. And I can really see the sort of networks of how each of my family members have come to make sense of the world in a really different way, you know, an intergenerational trauma. You know, I can look back at the First World War and how, you know, my great-great-grandfather died and that meant that my grandmother didn't have a, a father and so spent the rest of her life looking, you know, I can kind of look at these layers and, you know, my father's got a traumatic brain injury and he was drink driving as a medical student. And, you know, I can kind of look at all these layers of why was he drink driving Well, there was alcoholism in the family and, you know, it's not to blame anyone, but it is to kind of say trauma's really complex or what's traumatic for someone is, is really complex. And I find sometimes the way that trauma's talked about, like, who's the expert in trauma? And I get all these emails, you know, trauma expert is here, come listen to Bessel van der Kolk or Janina Fisher, and, like, they're great. But they still talk in a way that like they're the experts on those other people, those traumatised people. 
And I find that way of speaking actually really disempowering and misses a whole lot of intellectual richness because it's kind of that the analogy I had of a sort of anthropologist going, look at these funny people, what are they doing? Um, yeah, so I really challenge, and I don't know what language we can use around trauma. I keep asking people, you know, how do you make sense of your experiences? What was difficult? What, you know, what do you think is driving some of these? Because I think the trauma word can create an us and them, or, or uh, the people who have trauma and kind of have a legitimate excuse for being, you know, complex, and then there's the people who don't have trauma, and it's like, well, what's wrong with them? And I just think that way of looking at this is just really, really problematic. Marinda says that she's had people come up to her after conferences and say they wish they'd been abused as a kid because then they'd have, an ex they'd have a reason for being so messed up. And that mm. is just, you know, and I, I can understand that logic. You know, you want an explanatory frame and if you don't have a capital T trauma that the world <coughs> says, yes, you, your, your trauma counts, you're left with this sense of, well, I must be bad somehow. Um, Child parts, I've mentioned this a few times, so I've put a couple of names up there. That's a bit of a risk. Some of my little guys don't really like being, you know, paraded on stage, but um, it's hard to talk about them without putting names. So Molly's my youngest, and Molly's the attached part. She's the one who was really desperate for someone. Like, we didn't have an attachment figure, and so kind of she's the part of me that right throughout school would be like, oh, that teacher looks mummy-shaped. Maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll attach to her. Um, you know, it's a very strong attached thing, but it's also led me to have, for example, sexual relationships with people who are completely inappropriate, but they paid me a bit of attention, and I was like, awesome! Um, and sometimes complete random strangers I've attached to over the years, or trusted in a way that is not actually very, um, you know, it's not my adult that's doing that, it's a little child part that's like, oh my god, here's someone who gets me. Um, which makes sense if you think about, as a small child, I didn't have that need met. Um, Lucy, my three-year-old, uh, has a mistrust dynamic, so Lucy does not, like, because by that stage I was being abused, and so there's a really strong sense of fear and rejection. And so this conflict between Molly and Lucy is kind of sometimes I'll attach, it's that I hate you, don't leave me kind of thing that gets called splitting and all sorts of things, and I'm like, sure you can call it splitting, but why do people split? Can you, like... Do you know what I mean? It doesn't offer an explanatory frame, whereas for me, understanding these little parts, particularly supporting Lucy to figure out, like, how do we find out who to trust? And, like, thank you for saying you don't trust. Sometimes Lucy will arc up and say someone's not trustworthy way before my adult can understand, and she's usually right. There's usually something that's actually not trustworthy. Um, kids who've been abused develop incredible radars, incredible radars, because their lives depend on it. They really have to figure out stuff around safety. Um, Max, my eight-year-old superhero protector, the one who um, goes swimming in the fountains and, God, that was fun, um, really comes from a place of adults suck, adults don't understand. And that, I think, is sometimes true. I think a lot of people are being grown-ups, but actually, they don't know what's going on. We're all just trying to figure stuff out. Um, but Max is definitely the one who is non-compliant. Um, and I understand that because by that age I really did realise the grown-ups were not going to protect me. I tried really hard to try and find, you know, grown-ups to protect me. Misha is the angry part and she, I mean, really bad stuff happened to me as a kid and I couldn't express how angry I was because it wasn't safe. If I expressed that I was angry at my father, actually I was terrified that, and he was a very violent man. Um, you know, and so, or, or to express to my mother as well, I was desperate for an attachment figure, so I couldn't say, you're really letting me down. Um, you know, the, the, the danger for a child of having absolutely no attachment figure is, is utterly terrifying. Um, and so I, I squashed that anger, and I was a really, really good kid. I was a really sweet, good-natured, you know, and I actually look back and I'm like, that was kind of weird. Like, the, the, I was not expressing anger that was actually, I think, needed to be expressed. And so, um, yeah, uh, and sometimes that explodes. Sometimes Misha's just not able to, you know, it's like, we'll be good, we'll be good, we'll be good, boom. And, you know, some people with this diagnosis, you know, explosive anger is part of what it looks like. And for me, it is often because anger hasn't been able to be expressed in a way that is um, directed at the right place. And so often for me, self-harm has actually been Misha expressing anger, but it hasn't been safe relationally to actually express anger at the people that I want to express it. And Lily, my little compliant one as well, she's the one who just desperately wants to get along in the world and wants to make everyone happy. And, you know, that 
there's often tensions between these different parts of me. I love, Janina Fisher says, never trust a grown-up who doesn't have child parts. I really do strongly argue that everyone has different parts. It's just that for some of us, these child parts are really, really compartmentalised and really strong. And that sometimes they'll take over in ways, like when we're in a trauma response, that they're really, really intense. In open dialogue, we talk about polyphony, about vertical polyphony, so your internal different voices, you know, the voice of you that's a dad, the voice of you that's a... <coughs> I don't know, child of an alcoholic, the voice of you that loves playing guitar, you know, all the different parts of us. Um, and then horizontal polyphony is the different people in the network. Open dialogue absolutely encourages more and more polyphony to have more of that. Instead of forcing ourselves to pretend that we're like completely, we just have one, like one truth that we always stick to that. It's like, no, often we've got multiple parts of ourselves. Relational, emotional disavowal, canary in the mind. I was talking about that before, the idea that um, sometimes my distress is actually related to the environment I'm in, but usually if I'm feeling suicidal, it's not just me. There's actually something going on in the environment that I'm in that is actually crazy making, and I'm the one who kind of experiences it. In an open dialogue context, often the person who's diagnosed is the one who's holding something for the entire network. So, for example, as a family I remember working with in London who were five brothers, one of them had a psychosis diagnosis and he was the one who said, everyone else said, our childhood was fine, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, except for the time Dad covered himself in petrol and set himself alight and ran down the street, did anyone else, like, remember that? And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 Shh, you know. And there's a way in which he was the one who kind of held the distress of the whole network. In my family, I do really see that my mum's unresolved trauma herself. She had no one to support her. A lot of her stuff ended up being projected onto me, and so it was kind of, I was a difficult child, rather than her life was incredibly difficult living with someone who was doing terrible things. Um, and so I really see that often people end up in networks, you know, kind of taking on a role. So, to finish up, oh no, here's a quote that I love. Expecting marginalised peoples to disregard their own emotions to calmly educate you is the epitome of entitlement. Mm -hmm. I use this quote because I love it. <coughs> it's also, it's really, really emotional work, this stuff. But expecting people, particularly traumatised people, to disregard their own, their own emotions. I feel like that's what I was taught to do in rehab and a lot of psych wards. It was like, you behave, little girl. I actually think that that's a really destructive um, yeah, demand from people and I actually think it's socially regressive to expect people who have been through trauma. That's part of why I'm so passionate about the organisation I work for Partner Speak because it is actually about speaking and saying, yeah, we need to speak collectively. Um, and I think that calling people, saying that people have a personality disorder instead of listening to stories of what people have experienced, I think is socially regressive. It can be socially regressive. I'm very um, public about my abuse as a child because I think that a lot of people have experienced these things and there are ways in which we don't collectively acknowledge that this is a thing that happens. So six gifts to end. Six gifts of those who might be labelled BPD. I really do fight the idea that BPD is just a bad thing that we need to like stop and prevent and contain. Um, so yeah, our sensitivity can be an incredible radar for toxic social environments. I have some friends who have this label and when they say something's not okay, I'm like, sure, I had not picked that up, but now that you mention it, you're right, I'm feeling uncomfortable, I just didn't recognise the register on my radar, like the canary in the mine. Self-harm can be a truly ingenious way of meeting multiple competing needs. For example, express anger without being punished. That's certainly been my experience. There's a particular project I was working on where I wanted to say this is fucked and I couldn't. So instead, I, I'm not going to finish that sentence. I self-harmed in a way that was my way of expressing my feelings but without being punished, without losing the relationships. Able to stay in toxic contexts. I think of my mum as well in this case. I mean, everyone self-harms as well. My mum was a cancer specialist who smoked her entire professional life, a palliative care cancer specialist. But smoking, I know for me, has allowed me sometimes to stay in a toxic environment. Go out, have a smoke, come back. You know, go out, have a drink. You know, you, you can keep going with your life. Um, so I think self-harm can sometimes be a really, there's some genius in it and how can we listen to it and be like, what's going on here? Rather than shut it up, like be, giving someone a rubber band. If I get one more freaking rubber band, I'm like, it's not about 
like the rubber band is not listening. <coughs> or maybe the rubber band is listening, I don't know. What get called splitting can be a really useful way of bringing into light tensions between people that haven't yet registered other people's radars. You know, when people get, when people say, this person's splitting the team, I'm like, is the team really that united? Are you all on the same page? Or maybe this person is actually kind of a bit of a distillation. Many of us speak truths, possibly explosively, that others know are too fraught with social consequence to say out loud. Sometimes we just explode. It's like actually we just can't not speak. Um, and I think sometimes what people say when they explode is lost because people only hear the explosion. Mm -hmm. I've certainly been guilty of that. I've had people lose their shit at me and I don't want to hear what they're saying because I'm so hurt and, oh, that was hard. Um, two more. Everyone dissociates. Zoning out when someone is speaking BS. I mean, everyone does it. <laughs> when we dissociate intensely, often something really bad is happening, but it's not relationally safe to say anything. For example, the person who is speaking BS is in a dominant position of power. You know, the ways in which people in toxic work environments, everyone just shuts it off. You know, someone starts talking about whatever. Um, I think it's an insightful gift to our networks. If I find myself dissociating, it's like, what's going on here? Something is going on. And finally, our uncertainties about who we are. You know that thing about BPD, about people not knowing, you know, not being able to stick with things, not knowing who they are? I think that's also, it can offer, can tap into deep existential human questions about what it is to be inconsistent. Otherwise, people can be compliant, conformist, and kind of just stuck in a rut. So there's a quote from Walt Whitman, I'll finish with, do I contradict myself very well, then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. And then I've got a couple of resource slides. Um, so I'm going to leave the PowerPoint with whoever the powers that they are, and you're welcome to get a copy, you know, so, mm -hmm. yeah, the end. I am 100%. Questions and comments, most yes, welcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what therapies, or how do you manage to find these parts? and to identify them yeah. so clearly. Yeah, so I found them originally, I um, read a book called The Artist Way that talks about like you use your left hand and you can, you know, come into contact with your eight year old. That wasn't about people who dissociate or have these kind of intent. That was just everyone has an inner child according to this kind of way of thinking. And I was really shocked just how loud that voice was for me. And I did things like went and bought socks that that little one, I was like, this is kind of cool. And then I went to a trauma retreat called Heal for Life, and they have a whole program about connecting with your inner child. They're really big on that, and there's a whole bunch of activities that they do. Then I went to the World Hearing Voices Congress, and so I'm really inspired by the Hearing Voices movement. And I've always kind of been a bit angsty about how I fit, because I'm like, I don't hear voices, but I have some pretty intense experiences that are actually, I think, on a continuum with hearing external voices. So from the Hearing Voices movement, I went to some training called a Maastricht Interview, which is a particular tool used in the Hearing Voices movement. And I, just because I was drawn to approach someone I really wanted to work with, and I said, will you work with me on this? And she said, well, do you hear voices? And I was like, not really, but I kind of have these child things going on. Can we look at that? And so I got to spend three days with someone profiling my voices. These days I have a psychotherapist who does somatic psychotherapy, so the body is a resource. Some of my really, some of the stuff that doesn't have words ends up in these kind of um, emotional landscapes. Working with the body has been really powerful, and so she comes very much from a somatic, from a child, she works with child parts. I also have a lot of friends who have child parts. So for example, during the FEMS conference last year, I had a complete freak out, I had a shame spiral, I had a vulnerability hangover. I'd like given a big talk, got a standing ovation and went home and went, ah, that was too intense. And so I rang a friend and she said, oh, what do you little guys need? And I said, I, I don't know. And she said, well, the aquarium's just next door. Why don't you go to that? And I was like, because there's a conference and I've got to stay here. And she's like, I think your little guys need something. So friends, Books, there's a whole lot of books, Helen Citra Stone talk about this, there's a lot of resources out there, but I also think we're only just scratching the surface. I feel like little parts are so insightful and have so much to offer, and I don't think we listen to them because I think we drug people and we diagnose them and we tell them to stop 
stop being such a naughty little girl. And I was like, no, actually, these parts are really insightful. I learned so much from dialogue with them. And But yeah, sometimes I do have professional help. Sometimes it's particular tools. Sometimes it's friends who also have little parts. Um, I run some training sometimes with other people who have little parts, and it's kind of hard for us to all behave ourselves <laughs> because we do just want to have fun too, you know. So, yeah. Thank you. And then they're my greatest teacher too. My little guys are like, yeah, they teach me. Like, there's ways you just ask them. Like, they, they, they tell me their names. I'm like, how the heck do they have names? Like, what is that? You ask them and they tell you. It's, it's a thing. And I know lots of, lots of people who have done that. And it's kind of, same with voice hearing. You know, people can find out stuff. And it's weird how much information there is. Like, what is that? I mean, Max is called Max. Obviously, it's a reference to where the wild things are. But, like, why did Max pick that name? And also, I had some stuff at a particular age where my gender was quite... I was misgendered a lot as a boy, and I found that really distressing. And now Max has all sorts of interesting gender stuff. Max is kind of is a girl, but also is questioning. And I'm like, this is weird having an internal life that is separate from my own. But it's also really cool. Max teaches me cool stuff. So yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, you mentioned um, the arts way, and it got me thinking about creativity. Um, do you find that absolutely? Um, having kind of creative pursuits, whether it's writing or art yep. or whatever it might be, yep. um, to be quite healing and therapeutic as well? Yeah, so one of the frameworks that I was offered in the rehab once that I'm sure lots of you have come across is the kind of adapted adult child, like the wounded child, the adapted adult child. I can be really adapted adult child, like really kind of, I'm good, I'm okay, I'm, I'll be good, you know, and creativity can kind of cut and be like, I know you can be very capable and all that, but let's just get on and draw and see what happens. Because the adapted adult child can kind of get in the way of... And so, yeah, creativity absolutely opens up weird possibilities. You're like, where did that come from? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And play. I just, I'm such a play advocate. I think mm. grown-ups don't play enough and kids who never got to play. Like, I was terrified mm. most of my childhood, so, you know, I didn't really play and play is really crucial. Yeah. And, uh, Hi. I've been subscribing to Asylum magazine for a while and aware of the Mad Pride yeah. movement, uh, which I'm really interested in. Yeah. Uh, but as far as I can make out, it's mainly centered around, or in the UK, happening in America. Um, are you aware of resources that are more local or, or sort of elements of that movement? And, 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 and what would you say about trying to get into it from the point of view of a mental health worker, but also maybe in terms of pointing to people who I support in that direction? Yeah, it's really complex. I think um, I certainly had to leave Australia to find the kind of community that I needed. Australia is just small population in some ways. But also, I think we are that community. So, for example, I've got some friends in Sydney who, one of them's a social worker. I think they're both maybe social workers, maybe. No, social worker and a psychologist. And they run a Mad Studies reading group. And in fact, there's one on tonight right now. And there's a woman called Julia Bocking, who's a academic from Canberra, who just happens to be in Sydney. And they're running a workshop tonight on co-production and critically unpacking co-production. Like, they're doing it. I feel like there's a lot of underground stuff, but um, yeah. it what's happening around the world has nourished me in a way that I needed. Um, there is definitely a push. There's a website called Mad in America and there's a bit of a, yeah, there's a possibility of Mad in Australia emerging soon. Um, there's a group called Inside Out and Associates in Sydney. If you ever want to go to any of their events, I cannot recommend them more highly. Really, really brilliant. And it's co-produced, you know, it's got two clinicians and a consumer between the three of them, they've set up an organisation to really have critical conversations, as they call them. Um, and in terms of pointing people in the direction, I'd say Facebook and the internet is just so rich and also kind of hit and miss. Um, but there's a lot of community there that I find is, you know, um, yeah, it's rich. Cool, thanks. Any other compliments or um, yes. 
I was wondering how you would view um, this recent experience that I had from an open dialogue perspective. Yeah. So um, recently I came across a psychologist who said to the consumer who had BPD that they were sucking everyone in into their vortex. Um, and the psychologist cares about the consumer and, and is giving feedback not in a negative way, like genuine concern kind of feedback. So how would you address that? So I work with people one on one these days or I work with networks and yeah that's a thing, that's a pattern of behaviour that that's what it feels like and I guess um, how do we create spaces where we can talk in a way that's not you are sucking everyone into your vortex but actually how are you making sense and how are the people around you, how do we hold people accountable where it takes me is I, when I was in the midst of that suicidal crisis, I discussed with my psychiatrist, maybe we could have an open dialogue style coming together. And my best friend was involved and it was really confronting hearing from her how my behaviours impacted her. And also for her to say, I don't know how to support you. Like, I actually don't know. So how do we create space where people can own more of what their part of it is? So this, they're sucking everyone into their vortex. I'm like, so what you're saying maybe is that you're feeling really um, frustrated with what you're witnessing, you're um, maybe feeling powerless and actually feeling concerned and you know it's like how do you own what's yours but also in a way that we hold each other, we have those difficult conversations and so one of the things Open Dialogue, one of the theories is that the more difficult the situation you just bring in more people, more voices and that can often mean more clinicians so they have this incredible capacity to have like two clinicians who go out to people's homes and you know it's and that the system's kind of responsive and um, but I, I guess I encourage how do we create environments where people can own their own emotional response rather than just blaming the person I mean it's not to say that that's not an observation but it's also very individualizing and I think in particular of, a, of someone I work with who I call her an unclient because I don't want to call her a client but I would say exactly the same thing. That's what it. That's sort of an observation that she's sucking everyone into her vortex. I've also witnessed how hard she's tried to get support, and how most of those supports are saying, "Go away. We don't. Like, we don't support people like you." She's been to a hospital. She's <coughs> been to a psychiatrist, psychologist. Used up her ten mental health. You know, it's like actually, it makes sense as well. <coughs> how to create space where we can hold the both end is tricky. Yeah, and I also say bring in more voices, you know, bring in more perspectives. There's always wisdom. It's amazing seeing how like Uncle Joel say something and it's like, you would never have been listened to in a traditional system and yet Uncle Joe's got amazing insight into the situation, so, yeah. Thanks. 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 Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's mm. really powerful your story and all your um, reframes were really helpful um, as a clinician, you know, the analogy of the canary in the mine. And, um, yeah, just just the, that terminology we use and thinking of it yeah. in a way. Yeah. And also, I've got to say, like, how, like I, I'm not a clinician. I, I kind of reject that self-labeling, but I am. I'm a family therapist. Is one possible? I, I work with people, and I'm like, yeah, this stuff's hard. <laughs> um, but to try and hold myself accountable, you know, that actually, yeah, thanks. So thank you. I'm just um, wondering, because it was a very different sort of a, a presentation tonight, um, I'm wondering whether perhaps Flick might appreciate hearing from people what they, um, what they <coughs> take from what happened tonight, from her presentation, how people reacted, what take home messages you might get or what, how it affected you. So, Rather than putting any one person on the spot, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we might spend a few minutes perhaps joining, you know, maybe three or four people where you're sitting and just have a bit of an exchange of ideas. And a check out to a kind of, oof, that was a bit intense, wasn't it? Or maybe not, that was a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> so